a sudden, my tracker started running past me, and I thought, what in the world are they running from? And I looked up, and 10 yards away from me, in a full charge, head down, coming at me like a locomotive, was a huge Cape Buffalo. When the buffalo started charging me initially, Leon, we were all caught by surprise, and Leon had just had time to, to shoot from the hip, like the split second before the buffalo hit me. He was carrying a double barrel 500 Krieger Hawk. On the Hunters Advantage podcast, we talk to companies like Drury Outdoors, Vortex Optics, City Gear, the National Wild Turkey Federation, and many more, all to help you. Whether you're a compound bow hunter, a traditional bow hunter, rifle hunter, or however you choose to chase your game, this podcast is the one for you. Whether you want to learn how to spot and stock elk in Colorado, how to conserve public lands, or how to start a business in the outdoor industry, we got you covered. I'm Christian Babcock. I'm going to be your host of this podcast, and my goal is to help you become the best overall hunter you can be by bringing you high-quality tips, strategy, and gear review information from brands and guests that you can trust. Thanks for tuning in on your drive to work while you're at the gym, drinking your morning coffee, or whatever you choose to do while consuming the Hunter's Advantage podcast. We appreciate your time. So this week on the podcast, I'm joined by Melissa Nagabauer. She is a hunter who has an awesome, awesome story um, that she's going to share with us. So maybe you could just start off by telling us or introducing yourself to our listeners. Well, I'm, my name is Melissa Nagabauer, and I grew up in Albany, Texas. It's a small, tiny spot up above Abilene, northeast of Abilene, and um, I think it's the greatest little town in Texas. It was a fun place to grow up. That's awesome. Cool. So how did you get started in hunting? Um, what got you started in that? Well, my dad was a hunter, and um, he he only had girl children. And since I was the youngest and willing to go with him, he would take me out to the river on Saturday mornings, and we would um, bird hunt and duck hunt and you know, anything, whatever the season was, that's, that's what we would do. It was, it was great fun for me to just be with dad out there in God's beautiful creation. Mm -hmm. That's something I've really thought about. Um, get, I'm getting married in June and I don't know how, how like, uh, soon we're going to have children or how that's going to work out. But I've wondered, and Lauren, Lauren, my fiance has asked me, you know, what's it going to be like if you have all girls? And I'm like, I really, I don't know how I'm going to navigate that. But I mean, it's really encouraging that girls are willing to go to. Absolutely. And you know, that daddy time is just precious. My dad is a great man. And, you know, it wasn't just about pulling the trigger. He taught me about the flowers and the birds and, you know, just noticing things out there that God created for our enjoyment. And, and yes, the animals are beautiful and it's fun to stalk. It's fun to, you know, good placement of the shot and all of that. But it's, um, it's more about just experiencing God and his creation. Yeah, that's awesome. So what did be happy to do that with their daddies? <laughs> yeah, I can't wait if that's in the cards for me. So what what animals did you grow up hunting? What what was uh, prevalent in in Texas? Well, the white tailed deer and um, turkeys, pigs, um, hogs. But mostly, I mean, our goal every year was to to hunt white tail. I my first buck was when I was 11 years old. It was a little spike and dad mm -hmm. was over at the moon. I think we drove, I don't know, to 10 of his buddies' houses so that they could all see my <laughs> spike in the back of the truck. It was, it was funny. How does this, how has hunting looked and how have you navigated hunting um, by being a mom now and, you know, traveling the world and what role has that played in your adult life? Right. That's a good question. Um, you know, just scheduling in advance, knowing that um, when we get home, dinner needs to be something easy and quick. And my own precious mother has is a, a saint, and she, um, when when we are hunting, my mom is usually 
nearby and so she helps with the dinner preparations and all of that so just thinking through being a mother and having children of my own before they were old enough to hunt themselves um, you know it's just advanced planning and thinking things through and making sure there's somebody to watch the kids when I go out and um, anyway we now that my boys and they started hunting early when we were in Africa Noah was eight and Nate was 10 and they had hunted you know before that trip and so starting early with gun safety and um, I don't know I think for me hunting has always kind of been a family um, activity my husband hunts and he actually didn't grow up hunting like I did but when we started dating and engaged and married we it's one of our favorite things to do together we may be in different places but you know, we, you know, if we go to different deer stands or whatever, but we know the others out there and mm-hmm. it's good stuff. Yeah. That's awesome. So Jill Sayer was telling me that I should talk to you because you have a really, really unique story about being attacked by a Cape Buffalo. Is it, was, were you in Tanzania when that happened? We were in Tanzania. Yes. That's It was, okay. um, shall I just launch into the story? Yeah. Yeah. I just, I want to hear the details of that. Because I've, I've talked to a few people about it, and they're like, yeah, that's definitely an episode that I would be willing to listen to. So I, I want to hear the details. Okay. Well, it was 2008, August of 2008, and our family, there again, it was a family event, um, three generations, my husband's mom and dad, my parents, and our boys, Nate and Noah. And um, we started in the, uh, the, the Salu area of Tanzania up in the plains area and we hunted had a great hunt up there and the zebra the gazelle um, plains game beautiful area of of Tanzania and then halfway through the 21 day hunt we transferred to the Rungwa area of Tanzania and that's where you know more rugged the that terrible little tasty fly lives and so there, it's not populated down there. People can't live down there, and it's just wild. And that's where all the dangerous game live, the lions, the leopards, lots of hyena, lots of huge herds of buffalo, and which is why we were down there. Um, my husband had had a really amazing uh, lion hunt. He was successful, and my boys, being 8 and 10 years old, wanted to, you know, they were out to hunt for a warthog, and and you know whatever crossed their paths but as we you know stayed a few days down there we ran into some puff adders and some black mambas and we realized okay really and truly now that Toby's had a successful hunt we think that it's best for him to take the boys with his parents um, back home and I stayed to hunt the rest of the hunt it was just a few days that um, that we had left with my parents and um, so Toby took the boys just because it just felt dangerous it felt like we were just you know looking for trouble having the little boys over there scurrying about for too many days so anyway Toby had them safely back in Washington DC and on the 18th day of our 21 day hunt I set out north with my professional hunter his name was Leon Lamprecht uh, amazing godly man, South African fellow, and my dad and his PH went south that day. And so the concession where we're hunting is almost a million acres. It's 900,000 something acres, huge. And so during the course of a hunting day, we never really crossed paths. We would um, we would see each other at, at the end of the day, and, and that was fine and great. We would share stories that... Um, Anyway, so on this particular day, we we set out and we um, pretty quick that morning got onto a herd of buffalo, and and my trackers we stalked and they got me lined up, perfect shot, beautiful buffalo. But I realized that the the buffalo was in his prime, and that's not what I was out to hunt. I wanted to hunt the old guys. And so didn't pull the trigger on that one. And after lunch, um, 
from the Jeep, the guy spotted another buffalo, and he appeared to be all alone. And usually when the buffaloes are old, they um, sometimes wander away from the herd to go off and be by themselves. And so we thought that was that, that situation. And so we unloaded and started tracking. And um, I don't know how many miles we had tracked, but we were deep in the deep in out there and tracking along. And all of a sudden, my trackers started running past me. And I thought, what in the world are they running from? And I looked up and 10 yards away from me in a full charge, head down, coming at me like a locomotive was a huge Cape Buffalo. He had been, we think he had been wounded perhaps. He was bedded down in the tall grass and so we didn't see him until we got real close and my trackers, you know, they weren't armed, they had their machetes. And um, anyway, they ran past me and since I wasn't running, the buffalo zoned in on me and here he came. And it's a little embarrassing, but at, at that moment, your brain kind of does what it wants to do. And my brain visualized a large tree, leafy green tree growing that I could run around while Leon, my PH, shot the animal and so I turned around and I took a few steps looking for this beautiful green leafy tree that was in my mind and it did not exist we were in elephant territory and and all of the trees were just little saplings so there was this little sapling and I caught hold of it to turn around and reassess the situation and try to figure out okay where is the buffalo and right as I was turning the buffalo hit me on the back of the hip and and tossed me into the air and I literally did a flip and when I landed I came down right between the horns of his right between his horns on his head and I landed I was my stomach was over draped over the boss that horn of his head and I was right between the horns so if I had landed two inches to the left or two inches to the right I would have had um the horn right through me and so God is good and this whole story is really a series of miracles and so that was miracle number one I was on the buffalo's head on my stomach my legs were straddling his nose and the buffalo took off running through the brush and I have no idea how long we ran he he was I was bouncing my gun was still on my shoulder and um in my mind, I was thinking, okay, I'm on a large animal. This is likely about to hurt. Something is going to happen next that's not going to be pleasant. And um, so the brain is still in slow motion. It's embarrassing what I thought about, but that's what I thought about. Mm -hmm. And eventually, he decided he didn't want me covering his eyeballs anymore. And so he slammed the brakes on and threw his head down. And I shot off and hit the ground and tumbled and skidded. And um, when I came to a stop, I was on my stomach. My gun had come off of my shoulder, and it was just out of reach. But I could hear the buffalo coming from behind me. And I thought, okay, this is it. Be small. I kicked my legs out, um, and I covered my head like a little turtle, and the buffalo ran over the top of me. But the miraculous thing is that this whole animal moving across my body, he did not step on me. And I wasn't watching this whole event because I was, you know, taking cover. I was covering my head. And um, but Leon, who was watching, said that the buffalo immediately turned around and then started slamming his head into the ground, trying to squash me with that boss of horn on his head but every time he would slam his head trying to squash me the horns hit the ground before that boss could reach my body so basically the cavity where that was created between the boss and his horns was little me in between those horns and just simply by the grace of god he didn't he never touched me never poked me with the horn, never squashed me with that boss. And for me, what I was experiencing, not watching it, because my head was still covered, but dirt was going everywhere in my face. And I could feel the breath of his nostrils on the back of my neck. And there was just chaos and confusion. And then, and then he left. And what had happened is Leon 
feeling hopeless with, you know, his gun trained on the buffalo, but he couldn't pull the trigger while I was on the buffalo or while the buffalo was on top of me. And so he literally went up and smacked the buffalo on the rump and hollered at him to take the buffalo's attention away from me. And so the buffalo turned and charged Leon. And so I have to back up right here just a few seconds on the initial charge when the buffalo started charging me initially, Leon, we were all caught by surprise and Leon had just had time to, to shoot from the hip like the split second before the buffalo hit me. He was carrying a double barrel 500 Kriegerhoff. I don't know how to pronounce that. It's a German made gun and he was loaded with solids. And so shooting at that close, like at five yards from the side, we think that the bullet just popped a hole in one side and came out the other side, maybe popped a hole in his stomach, who knows, but it didn't, it didn't put him down. It didn't slow him down. And, um, that's important because now that the buffalo is charging Leon, you know, this few minutes later, Leon hits the second trigger because this is his second shot. And he realized that that initial shot accidentally, he hit the second trigger. And so it was empty and the gun just went click. And he was, then the buffalo was on top of him and he just had time to swing his gun out matador style. And the buffalo actually hit the gun and bent his hand, it broke his hand. And that when he shot from the hip the first time, he exploded his thumb, his thumb had popped open. And so he's got broken and bloody hands and the buffalo has just, you know, charged him and he flew one direction, his gun flew the other direction, but he scrambled over to get his gun again because during the time when I could tell the buffalo had left me, I, I came out of my turtle shell, I peeked and I was reaching for my gun to see if I could get it and the motion attracted the buffalo to come back for me. And so Leon yelled at me, Melissa freeze, don't move. Buffalo was already coming back for me. Leon scrambled over, picked up his gun, pulled the front trigger, and the he didn't hit the buffalo that with that shot, but the sound made the buffalo veer away from me and head back off into the brush. And so um, that was kind of the end of that main ordeal. My trackers came out of hiding, and Leon came over, and everybody, I was still on the ground, and they said, okay, Melissa, what? You know, we know you're not dead, but what's happened? They didn't know that in all of that stamping and stomping and thrashing that he, the buffalo had literally not made contact with my body once. And so I wiggled everything. I wiggled my fingers. I wiggled my toes. And I said, praise God, I think I'm perfectly fine. And when I started to stand up and I put pressure on that hip, I, the, the hip muscle was mashed potatoes. I couldn't hold weight on it. And so I started to, you know, fall back down to the ground and one of the trackers caught me. And by that time, our Jeep driver was just arriving when he's trained, when he hears a shot to start making his way toward his hunter. And so um, he thinking that I had shot an animal um, arrived and the, the trackers were putting me into the Jeep because they knew they had to, they didn't know internally if anything had been ruptured or, or you know, you know, that a, a blow like that could pop an organ inside, I suppose. And so anyway, the, the last miracle that is so precious to me is that um, with all of the, the shooting and the chaos, my dad's driver, so my dad had gone south that morning we had gone north. We could have been six hours away from one another, but during the course of tracking different animals throughout the day, my dad's Jeep driver had seen our Jeep driver when he was headed toward us and he followed. And so right when they were putting me into the Jeep, my dad miraculously shows up all excited thinking, you know, that I had shot a, a, an animal and and anyway, I, that's when I burst into tears and I said, oh, dad, the buffalo got me. I didn't get the buffalo. 
But um, anyway, it has a very happy ending. We, we got back to the safari camp. My mom was there, and she, too, thought that exciting and celebration was about to happen. And um, anyway, when I, when I told my mom what had happened, she just fell on her knees and went into immediate prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for, for saving this child of mine, for protecting her. And anyway, we, we did fly out to Kenya that evening uh, to the hospital to make sure they did an MRI and, and everything to make sure internally I was okay. And, and the doctor that was on call, it was midnight before we got there, and he raised his hands in the air and he said, this glory goes to God because you are not a normal Cape Buffalo victim. That I didn't, I had a few scratches on my back and you know, actually it's kind of funny after you've survived an ordeal like that, you want a little bit of blood to show that you've been through a thing. But I had scratches on my back and a mashed hip muscle, and that is all. And so God is good. It's a story of his beautiful protection and sovereignty. And, yep, yeah, it's amazing. Wow. That's incredible. So, I mean, what is what normally happens if someone's attacked by a Cape Buffalo? What's what's the normal results? Right. Well, death or a long time in ICU. There was actually a professional hunter um, that w- that worked for the Freakins, and he was in the hospital while I was there. He he was such a nice man. He came to visit me a couple of times. I only spent one night, but during the course of the two days that I was there, I may have spent two two nights in the hospital. I can't remember. I think it was just one night, but he came to visit a couple of times and he had been charged by Cape Buffalo and had been gored and he lost quite a bit of his intestines and had been, he was, had been in the hospital two weeks already when I got there. And so he, he just wanted to hear my story over and over again. And he shared his story and he was like, you don't realize how fortunate you are. And I was like, you're right. I don't realize it right now, but maybe one day (laughs) I'll realize how very fortunate I am because buffaloes are big, you know, 1800, 2000 pounds. I don't know, but, um, they usually win. They Mm -hmm. usually, win. the hunter usually does not win. They're, They're I, and I, before I went to Tanzania, I read all of Craig Boddington's articles and I, you know, read Peter Hathaway Capstick's books. And I know, I obviously, everybody knows that Africa's dangerous and things happen. But it was one of those situations you think, oh, this happens to random people who live in random places. It doesn't happen to people like me. And so it's just, um, you know, it changes your perspective having survived something like that. And um, it's just, I, I guess it was such a mountaintop experience, and I was just flooded with such gratitude and appreciation for God's provision. I mean, I have, my Bible is highlighted through the Psalms with verses about God's protection and that he, you know, sends his angels to, to watch over us. And I really, I really believe that I experienced the protection of God himself, but via maybe one of his messengers, one of his angels. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. I mean, so what does this look like? um, How do you tell your your kids and your husband, hey, I just got attacked by a Cape Buffalo? (laughs) They were in Washington, D.C., and and my husband is type A personality. Of course, he springs into action. And at the time, when I first told him, I thought, you know, nothing is wrong with me other than this hip muscle. I, I really felt like inside everything was fine, but that was not the right answer for him. He needed me to get to a hospital to have it all checked out. And fortunately, we had taken the, um, you know, emergency insurance, the MedJet, whatever it was called. I can't even remember the company we used, but they flew in. Their pilots came that night and... Luckily, the pilot, one of the pilots had had experience flying into that particular little grass airstrip because there's a mountain right on the other side of it. It was almost dark when we took off. And, you know, there's not any runway lights out in those places. And so that he knew the terrain and he was able to not crash into that mountain was another beautiful thing. 
that was awesome. Um, yeah. <laughs> Man, God, so, God is good. He's God he's definitely is- good, and he was watching over you. So, did this experience? Did this not instill any any fear in you, and or discourage you at all to continue to hunt? You know, these really really wild animals. Right. No. Um, you know, I think it probably sobered me a little bit. Like, you know, Melissa is not immune to catastrophic disasters. So it, it did absolutely give me pause. But um, I am looking forward to the day that I get to go back into Africa and, and hunt again. I've already been on a bear hunt with a good friend of mine. Um accompanying her this was one of her life goals but no I you know there's we the world gives us a lot of opportunities to live in fear and God absolutely doesn't want us to live in fear he wants us to live abundant life and to walk in faith and he wants us to be wise and to use our heads and and you know to check our motives constantly but um to not walk in fear and so I've Luckily, from the earliest of my memory, my family has instilled that in me, that that we walk with faith and not in fear. That's awesome. So you talked about hunting bear. Was it grizzly bear that you hunted? Brown bear. Brown bear. Okay, awesome. So how do you you prepare yourself mentally for when you know you're going to hunt something? That, you know, Cape Buffalo, they're not super carnivorous, so you wouldn't expect them to try to eat you. But right. a brown bear, you know, he, he may. So how do you prepare yourself for that? Yeah. Well, you choose your hunting guide really carefully. And I right. think I had great confidence in Leon. And, you know, to this day, Leon is one of my heroes because with God's help, he saved my life. And I'm so appreciative of that great man. Um, And I knew that he would, before this all happened in Tanzania, I knew that Leon was there for my protection and he would do what it took to to protect me. And and he did. And so when we were interviewing um, outfitters for the bear hunt, I had that in the back of my mind and I had some good questions. I said, okay, you know, just a couple of years ago, I was almost killed by an animal. Are you going to let an animal kill me? And so putting putting great confidence and a lot of faith in your guide, um, choosing your guide carefully, I think is, for me, of great importance. Because I am a small woman, and I, I don't have the strength or the speed or that, you know, some other hunters would have. Um, so I, I need somebody to be there that and you know you also practice with your gun you have to have confidence in your ability you don't go into Alaska without um, having spent a little bit of time at the range beforehand so you talked a little bit about living fearlessly how we were not given you know a spirit of fear and stuff like that so what advice would you give to someone like me that wants to hunt these animals except with a bow which is exponentially, you know, just as scary as with a rifle and you have to get a little bit more intimate. So what advice would you give to me and how, how, how should I, how can I be fearless when I'm doing things like that? That is, I've only, I've only bow hunted white tailed deer and, and they don't tend to hurt people. So, um, that is a good question. And you just have to, there again, have confidence with your aim and be wise because a wounded animal is is not to be trifled with. Um, a mama hog is, you know, can be just as dangerous as any animal out there. So, um, yeah, I think, and always, I don't know, I, w- I would advise my own sons to hunt with someone when they're hunting wild game that is dangerous, dangerous game. Um, just in case something happens, I think backup is important. Maybe we could talk a little bit about conservation and for people that don't understand how, how in your opinion is animal conservation, how, how do, how do people that hunt care more about the animal than typically people that don't? And it's, it's really confusing because you think about, um, you know, the people that care about the animal are the ones that harvest and, and kill some. So how does that make any sense to you? 
You know, I, and I've actually gotten to share my thoughts with some people, good friends that are, you know, new friends that were surprised, A, that I hunted it all and then, you know, had, had questions about the morality of it and all of that. And I love being able to explain to people that hunters over everyone else in the world appreciate wildlife um, because they've been close and intimate. They've watched it. They've spent hours studying the habits of animals and and a true a, a true appreciation grows the more you spend time um, out in the field and um, in a deer stand just watching. It's it's there again. I always explain it's not about pulling the trigger. It's about being wise and knowing uh, wanting to have a healthy whether it's white-tailed deer. I'll use that as an example. You want your herd to be healthy and have the right ratio of bucks to doe because when when the ratio isn't right and when there's too many animals the you know the food sources get low and you just have to my dad is a rancher and so taking good care of you know harvesting the inferior bucks before you go for the trophy buck is important making sure you are harvesting the older animals and letting the the guys in their prime thrive um you know all of this is just super important and in africa the the safari outfits and you know there are always exceptions to the rule and un unfortunately there are always those hunters who who give the world of hunting a bad name because they they don't have right motives and they don't have right reasons and they are trigger happy so you know taking those to the side a true hunter that loves what they're doing um will that their dollars those safari dollars support um the economy of africa the safari dollars feed families and keep schools open for those african villages way out in the middle of nowhere on our safari we got to visit we got to visit um, one of the bomas and meet the children and we we took some school supplies out there and, and duffel bags and just the joy the pure joy on their faces and they knew that we were hunters i mean we came in a safari jeep we had our guns and they knew that we were hunters and they celebrated us because they knew that those hunting dollars helped them get to go to school it helped mm -hmm pay their teachers and that their families. We donated most of our, all of our meat that we didn't eat. We donated it to the surrounding villages. And you know that there's beauty in that. There's beauty in knowing that you are getting to help a village prosper and survive um, while you're getting to do something that you enjoy for, for good and proper and right reasons. Yeah, and Africa, I, yeah. go ahead. I, I, was, I love that nothing goes to waste in Africa. They, every organ is consumed. They dry things out. They know how to cook it. And they, nothing, nothing, nothing goes to waste. And I love that. Yeah, something that I had heard that's really interesting about Africa is I had, I had talked to, or I'd heard a, or watched a video about um, elephant poaching and stuff like that in Africa and how it supports the local economy. So when someone comes in and kills an elephant and they pay a hundred thousand dollars to do it, you know, that supports anti poaching that supports people doing the wrong thing and killing animals. They were saying like a hundred elephants in Africa were being killed a day. And that, that to me is insane. But like, yeah, I mean the money that people spend does, they do care about the animals and it goes to conserve the animals. And like, that to me is super cool. It is. And the, the organization that we went with, um, Leon's team, they have a, a guide and it takes a lot of money to pay for a man to stay the whole summer on the property on their hunting concession, just driving around anti-poaching positions. And that's what a lot of people don't realize. The greatest anti-poaching advocates are the safari camp owners and the concession owners because they post people it's important enough for them to protect the animals that live on their concession to post men to guard it and that you know it doesn't stop poaching but it it makes the poachers think twice before they go on to a particular 
into a particular area. So mm -hmm. it's all important. Yeah, you had talked a little bit about um, taking older animals out of the herd and stuff. And um, an interesting perspective that I had heard um, recently was that when you take an older animal out of the herd, it's probably going to be the most merciful death that it's ever going to um, it's ever going to encounter. So an animal in, in nature, and I'm sure in at life in Africa for a Cape buffalo that's older is is really really cruel. I'm sure that when they get weak and old, that lions are coming after them, hyenas are picking at their feet, you know, yeah. and and people don't realize that. And I just think that a lot of people need to understand that regardless of the way and the means that an animal is going to be taken, it's going to die at some point in its life. And hunters, you know, they just are an aid to do that the most merciful way and they have the utmost respect for the animal. So that's just something I wanted to throw in there. Yeah, absolutely. So where, if someone wants to keep up with you, where can they, where can they do that? Oh, goodness. Well, I don't post a lot, but I have a Facebook account and okay. uh, Instagram. I'm actually on Instagram more than Facebook. It's time cool. consuming, but yeah. Instagram, I'm mnog. So <laughs> this has been really, really fun. And thank you for just giving me a little bit about your story. I think you are really, really going to enjoy um, what you had to say. And that was an incredible story. Thank you very much, Christian. I love telling it. It makes me happy. Thank you very much. Yeah. To God be Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode of the Hunter's Advantage podcast. If you guys enjoyed this, make sure to leave us a review on iTunes of what you thought of the show.